Hello and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. At the height of their power, Hanna-Barbera produced over 80% of all children's programming on American television. The studio was instrumental in establishing not only Saturday morning cartoons, but TV animation as a whole. In this video, we're going to look back at their output during the most prolific period, the 1970s. Now to clarify, these are shows that began in the 70s, rather than shows that simply ran. We will also be looking at some of the people and influences behind their creation. Following Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the United States government began rounding up citizens of Japanese descent. Anybody with even an ounce of Japanese ancestry would be forced from their homes and into internment camps. One such camp was the Manzanar War Relocation Center in Owens Valley, California. Given that it was located in a desert climate, detainees were exposed to harsh weather and substandard living conditions. Over 100,000 Japanese Americans were imprisoned at Manzanar between 1942 and 45, including an 18-year-old Owao Takamoto. Takamoto had been born in Los Angeles and was taught illustration by another prisoner in Manzanar. Upon being released, he submitted his work to Disney and was hired as a character designer, working on such films as Cinderella, Peter Pan, and 101 Dalmatians. In 1961, he left Disney for Hanna-Barbera. Now, we covered the origins of Hanna-Barbera in our Reviving IP video, and the hiring of Takamoto more or less picks up where we left off. Hanna-Barbera has been called the General Motors of Animation for their ability to pump out cartoon after cartoon like a factory. They accomplished this by cutting corners with their animation, but also by repurposing characters and formulas. Case in point, the Jetsons and the Flintstones both offering takes on the then modern family. Takamoto worked in various creative capacities at Hanna-Barbera, but his most enduring contribution was designing the character model of Scooby-Doo. While Hanna-Barbera have given us several iconic characters, none have seemingly had the longevity Scooby has. His first appearance was in 1969's Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? This show was created as a response to concerned parent groups, notably Action for Children's Television, who had protested the violence in the superhero cartoons of the 1960s. It featured a group of teenagers driving around solving mysteries with an anthropomorphic dog, uh, a formula that would prove very lucrative for Hanna-Barbera, as we are about to see. Scooby's second outing was 1972's The New Scooby-Doo Movies. This featured the cast of the original series, joined by a different celebrity guest star each episode, with appearances by Dick Van Dyke, Tim Conway, and Sonny and Cher, uh, just in case you were wondering what decade you were in. Uh, it also featured characters, rather than actors, many of whom were part of other Hanna-Barbera shows, like the Super Friends, Batman and Robin. When looking at Hanna-Barbera's output in the 1970s, it generally falls into three categories. Adaptations, or send-ups of popular properties, clones of existing Hanna-Barbera characters, and crossovers. Uh, it's important to note that none of these lasted more than two years, and many were cancelled after just one season. Youth culture and rock and roll were major themes in Hanna-Barbera's programming, and nowhere is this more obvious than in 1970's Josie and the Pussycats. Inspired by Filmation's The Archie Show and the hit song it spawned, Sugar Sugar, Hanna-Barbera produced Josie and the Pussycats based on the comic also published by Archie Comics. The show revolved around the misadventures of a three-piece pop band. You had drummer Melody, bass player Valerie, and lead Josie. A real-life band was assembled to record songs for the series by producer Danny Jensen, consisting of Kathy Doerr, Cheryl Ladd, and Patrice Holloway. Now, a little bit of controversy. When Jensen showed the group he chose into William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, they pressured him to replace Holloway, since they chose to portray the band as all white. It was only after three weeks, and Jensen threatened to quit over the issue did Hanna Barbera relent. Patrice Holloway would go on to sing lead vocals on the show's theme, which became a hit, and in true Hanna-Barbera fashion, they followed it up by sending the characters to space. The same day Josie and the Pussycats debuted, Harlem Globetrotters premiered, based on the novelty basketball team. Uh, for those that may be unfamiliar with the Globetrotters, they are a sports entertainment act that incorporates aspects of theater into their games. As a wrestling fan, needless to say, I prefer this to the NBA. Uh, the Globetrotters, I think, lend themselves perfectly to animation because they are essentially a real-life cartoon. Uh, this series is notable for being the first cartoon to feature a predominantly black cast, and like Josie and the Pussycats, they would be repurposed later in the decade as superheroes and super Globetrotters. Why? Both Josie and the Globetrotters, missed opportunity, contain Scooby DNA, but for a more blatant repackaging, we have the Funky Phantom, featuring a group of teens solving mysteries with an American revolutionary ghost. Or how about Goober and the Ghost Chasers, which is pretty much Scooby-Doo, only sometimes the ghosts are real, and Clue Club. There were two dogs in that one. 
The concept of young people solving mysteries with anthropomorphic beings continue with Speed Buggy, a do buggy voiced by the legendary Mel Blanc, as well as Jabberjaw, a shark drummer that battled supervillains in a futuristic water world. The previous decade, Hanna-Barbera found considerable success with the Flintstones, and throughout the 1970s they continued capitalizing on their popularity by spinning the characters off into various series. These included The Pebbles and Bam Bam Show, starring the children of the original series grown into aspiring rock stars, uh, The Fred and Barney Show, or sorry, The New Fred and Barney Show, which placed the titular characters in supernatural situations. Uh, these shows would also be repackaged, imagine that, into programming blocks where they were sometimes paired with other shows, such as The Flintstone Comedy Hour, Fred Flintstone and Friends, and Fred and Barney Meet the Schmo. Schmo? 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 The Flintstones' influence can also be seen in 1972's The Roman Holidays, same idea, puns, the Roman Empire, as well as the sitcom Wait Till Your Father Gets Home, in that it aired in prime time. With Your Father Gets Home was more inspired by Owen the Family, boring most of that show's dynamics, mainly an old conservative bickering with his young liberal children. Hanna-Barbera had a knack for either parodying or adapting live-action properties into animation. Captain Caveman in The Teen Angels, while also a Scooby clone, is a parody of Charlie's Angels, uh, come to think of it, so with CB Bears. Uh, tribute was paid to Daredevil Evil Knievel in the comparatively more serious Devlin, which followed a traveling stunt writer in his day-to-day -day life. In terms of adapting existing properties, we have several cartoons based on popular television shows at the time, uh, like The Addams and Partridge Families, the latter inexplicitly 200 years in the future. Uh, not sure who asked for that. Uh, working with Toho, they would also adapt Godzilla into a cartoon, as well as DC superheroes in the Super Friends. Well, so far, this makes it sound like Hanna-Barbera was lacking in originality. They did have some new ideas during the decade in Hong Kong Fooey, uh, voiced by Scatman Crothers, excellent, as well as Inch High Private Eye in C Lab 2020. Still, they had spent over 10 years building up a stable of characters they were more than happy to show off and throw together in crossover series. Yogi's Gang presented the adventures of Yogi Bear, along with Crickjaw McGraw, Huckleberry Hound, Snagglepuss, and the rest, many of whom would also appear in Yogi's other crossover series, Yogi's Space Race. This, with Galaxy Goof-Ups, intended to the coattails of Star Wars, and was similar to Hannah Rivera's Wacky Races, where their characters competed against each other in various races. <laughs> Speaking of competing against each other, no discussion of Hannah Rivera in the 70s would be complete without mentioning the Laugh Olympics. This was an obvious spoof of the Olympic Games, as well as the Battle of the Network Stars, with the Hanna-Barbera characters competing in various events. They were grouped into three different, I guess, nations. Uh, you had the scooby Doobies, the yogi Yahooies, and the Really Rottens. It was hosted by Snagglepuss and Mildew Wolf, with an unseen announcer calling all the action. Uh, every episode would take place in a different country, and events range from real sports to the absurd, with each team taking either the gold, silver, or bronze medals. Uh, in case you were wondering, the Scooby Doobies hold the record for the most gold. In the 1970s, Hanna-Barbera not only ruled television animation, but they captured and reflected the times and society these characters were created in. Uh, I feel it's very similar to how I view The Simpsons. Uh, my age corresponds with the seasons, so I can pick one and see what or who was in the cultural consciousness in that given year. Uh, it's an excellent snapshot into the period and its pop culture, and though we have not covered all of Hannah Rivera's output in the 1970s, this should give you a decent overview of one of the largest animation studios at the height of their power. Uh, I'm no expert, so feel free to correct or comment down below. I will post links to relevant material in the description. And if you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash pixelportraits. Uh, you can get exclusive videos and deeper looks into the topics covered, as well as everything we publish. I'm Brian Clark. Thank you so much for watching.